essentially the book, as I said, is an updated and revised version of my PhD. Once, just to look at its title, The Global Prosecution of Core Crimes Under International Law. If I were to dissect it for a moment, I think you could simply speak of prosecution of core crimes as being the main keywords. Because essentially what I try to do in my research is ask a few questions. If I were to uh, simplify in very colloquial terms what I actually research and study and analyze, I ask who will prosecute core crimes. When I ask who, obviously I mean where will these be prosecuted in terms of a court, uh, either an international court under the internationalized model of criminal justice or else a domestic court under the domestic model. And when I ask who and where, I'm also asking why and how. So how will core crimes be prosecuted? Why will core crimes be prosecuted? Where and who will be prosecuting such core crimes? So if I were to try just simplistically to uh, summarize my main research questions, I think that is a very simple way of explaining all this and in my opinion in my humble opinion the largest benefit of the book is probably of my research and it's also what encouraged me to research in this way was that I adopt a rather global perspective that's why the word global really because I analyze both the vertical system of enforcement and the horizontal system of enforcement under one study using the same lens so in a way, that is also a major benefit because I don't only analyze the systems per se, but I analyze the interrelationship between both, which I think is important in this context. However, doing this, I limit myself, obviously, to the stage pre-trial, actually pre-surrender and pre-extradition. So I limit myself to the stage wherein a person is not yet physically transferred to a court or a tribunal which will consider... Uh, which will determine his guilt or innocence. So, obviously, the limitation is important. However, in order to try to restrict your study and to be able to specialize in a particular stage of the criminal process. And in this context, I adopt a multi-layered approach by means of analyzing various models of criminal justice, the domestic model under the HSC, the horizontal system of enforcement, and the internationalized model with all its various permutations. I focus on the ICC because I wanted my study, my work, to be forward-looking. It's the only permanent international criminal court. However, I still give importance to other models within the internationalized uh, criminal justice model, such as uh, specialized courts, I also consider hybrid courts, I considered the ad hoc tribunals more as a, uh, in terms of their legacy, in terms of the guiding principles they obviously, uh, and, and in terms of the judgments, the important judgments which these tribunals and the contribution to international criminal law of these hybrid, tri of the ad hoc tribunals, the former Yugoslavia and the Rwanda tribunals. I keep in mind essentially, and this is a I would say, uh, a pretext to the work. The extraordinary dynamics of system criminality. We're dealing with situations whereby, for example, in the case of the ICC, it has to seek cooperation from governments whose members it's trying to prosecute. Hence, we're in a, in a space of international criminal law whereby having certain fragile mechanisms is, I would say, nearly natural. It's taken for granted to an extent. We're dealing with structural impunity, and here I also develop what I call is a self-delegitimization process. And I examine gravity and seriousness in terms of the core crimes, also by, as a result of the non-fulfillment of obligations of states. The main obligation of a state being the obligation to investigate, the obligation to prosecute. Obviously, we're speaking about the territorial state, this being a main obligation of states. And the failure to do so leads me to conclude that a crime is of serious concern to the international community. I acknowledge, I concede, that core crimes cannot be subjected to a strict legal definition. In fact, I provide a workable definition of the term, of the term core crimes in this context. I obviously as well, in order to understand the concept of core crimes, 
I distinguish core crimes from transnational organized crimes and from other species of crimes, core crimes being such a unique species of crime. In the third part, which is the vertical system of enforcement, besides distinguishing between the various internationalized models of criminal justice, I explain verticality, and most of all, I, I, in a way, I celebrate the VSC, the vertical system of enforcement, in all its shapes and sizes, insofar as it is a very important frame of reference. It's an important frame of reference for the horizontal system of enforcement, and I say why, the reason being obviously complementarity, capacity building, but also it fills the impunity gaps, it diversifies mechanisms in criminal justice in general, and hence it contributes even possibly for the formation of new general principles of law, amongst other contributions. Uh, I advocate, well, I urge more than advocate the ICC to display more judicial activism. My opinion, given its competence, competence, its arbiter of its own jurisdiction, in certain areas, especially cooperation, given the fragile regulatory regime. In the field of cooperation, in my opinion, the ICC could possibly um, uh, adopt a more teleological approach. I think this could be important in the context of uh, solving the, gr the greatest uh, vulnerability of the ICC regime in general. So uh, this could be done more in cooperation in terms of procedural international criminal law. There is less room for maneuver in substantive international criminal law also because of the elements of crimes. We have a very uh, thorough legal document which articulates the constitutive elements of each and every crime. So probably in, in the area, on the field of cooperation, this could be, um, uh, th this is a possibility or an opportunity for the ICC, which it may want to consider for future reference, obviously. And I explain how and why. In this context, in the 10th chapter, I also analyze the cooperation regime. Essentially, the uh, relationship between state parties and the ICC and the relationship between non-state parties and the ICC, particularly when a case is triggered by the Security Council, by Security Council resolution, and hence the ensuing obligations of states, propose a few measures, uh, amongst which the establishment of a compliance committee in terms of Section 112, Subarticle 4, as a subsidiary organ of the ASP, of the Assembly of State Parties, adoption of countermeasures by states which may want to invoke rules of state responsibility, confirmation of charges under Article 61, sub-Article 2, even in spite of the fact that the person has not yet been surrendered yet, the individual has not been surrendered yet, and more mandatory wording in Part 9 of the statute rather than relying on cooperation and assistance in a spirit of consent. I would feel and believe that we should speak of state obligations, not merely, uh, in, not merely cooperation and assistance, fully-fledged state obligations. So those are a few points which I had raised also when I discussed the cooperation regime. Most importantly, I analyzed the grounds for refusal of surrender. Which grounds can a state invoke? in order to fail to decide not to surrender an individual to the ICC. Um, I examine the main grounds, essentially those arising from admissibility challenges. Here we're speaking of the genuine willingness or ability to prosecute, nebisinidem, and the postponement of an execution of a request to surrender. In the first, uh, well, most of them are also interlinked. In fact, I explain how genuine willingness or ability to prosecute could be interlinked with Nebis and itself, and so on and so forth in relation to the other grounds. Uh, in relation to the first one, uh, I analyze in detail, and this could still be very relevant today, the conundrum relating to Saif al-Islam. The reason being that essentially here, from the last report I read, the, report, the, the actual statement by uh, Ms. Fatou Ben Souda, Chief Prosecutor to the Security Council, his whereabouts have been indicated in turn, at least probably he's in the Zintan area in Libya, and there is a continuing obligation to surrender him, especially now that his admissibility challenge was unsuccessful. This um, 
this statement was delivered in May by Ms. Fatou Ben Souda, and the pre-trial chamber decision was delivered in April, just a few days before. And here I examined this in the context of what I call overt determination, maybe some excessive determination to prosecute and investigate, because this could actually, paradoxically enough, be very risky, because it could lead to inadmissibility, uh, insofar as um, actually it could lead to admissibility, insofar as uh, his trial in absentia, his, uh, the decision to um, proceed with the death penalty in his regard could also lead to the nullity of this, these proceedings in such manner as to, as to basically lead to a situation of unwillingness of the state. I tried to look at the Saif al-Islam case from various angles, and whichever angle I tend to adopt, and whichever way I looked at the case, as I said, from various perspectives, I always concluded the case is admissible, and hence the ICC should be the prosecuting forum in this case. And in this context, in the vertical system of enforcement, I determined that there are three main instances where it should be used at the expense of the horizontal system of enforcement. I would prefer the VSC, the vertical system, essentially when a brutal dictator is being brought to justice, in fact I term this as the Milosevic exception, when a case is triggered by a United Nations Security Council resolution, and we obviously know that we have 1593, the Darfur Resolution, and the unanimous 1970 Libya Resolution, but also when due process of law is a, I wouldn't say an impossibility, but a near impossibility. Saif Salislam uh, delivery of uh, the, the judgment the, in, after the trial, which was not really a trial because also it was delivered in absentia, is a case in point. Then I proceed to examine the other grounds, um, conflicting obligations comp and competing requests, um, uh, specific requirements under national law. Here I examine abuse of process, the doctrine of abuse of process and the concerted action paradigm, and also diplomatic privileges and immunities. And the last ground being the rule of specialty or speciality as it's called by some jurists, being the only traditional extradition-based ground which found its place in the ICC statute. From the VSC, I move on to the main system of enforcement, which is the horizontal system of enforcement. And here I explain how complementarity under the VSE is mirrored by subsidiarity in the horizontal system of enforcement. And what gels both, really and truly, the bridge which keeps these together is a very important rule of international law, which I examine in detail. Out dedere, out judicare, the obligation to extradite or prosecute. My 13th chapter is an intense and detailed uh, examination of this rule of international law, its nature, its status. It comes in many shapes and forms and sizes, which I call formulae, and I examine in detail how they are out judicare, both under convention and international law, under customary international law, etc., and even pieces of legislation within various domestic states. Um, uh, in this context, obviously together with a comprehensive analysis of jurisprudence and case law relating to our dedere aut judicare and also the prioritization of the dedere lim vis-à-vis -vis the judicare lim and vice versa. Issues of ranking, uh, especially when jurisdiction is concurrent, and also an examination or at least some opinions as to which is the most preferred place of prosecution, the forum convenience. In this study, the horizontal system of enforcement being the main system of enforcement, let's remember that we have a decentralization of prosecutions and what I call a domestication of international criminal law. I examine the main grounds of refu for refusal, this time not of surrender but of extradition. The grounds by means of which a requested state can refuse extradition from a requesting state. And I find that the most resilient grounds are the human rights grounds, those linked with human rights. So um, non-extradition of nationals, the political offense exemption, the military offense exemption, uh, double criminality, amnesties, plea bargaining, etc. Uh, most of these grounds are losing impetus, clout and weight. 
because of approximation of laws, because of harmonization of laws, because of new systems, particularly within regions, such as the framework decision of 2002 relating to the European arrest warrant, which even softened, softened double criminality rule, for example, at least within the EU region. Um, most of these grounds, as well because of other developments in international law, are losing power. However, human rights grounds retain a certain amount of power insofar as they can actually block an extradition. And in this context, the main grounds which I analyzed are the right to a fair trial, the uh, prohibition of torture and other cruel and human degrading treatments or punishment, nebisinidem, but also the death penalty, particularly death row. So in the case of the right to a fair trial, I rely very much on various decisions by the human rights mechanisms, particularly the ECHR, the European Court of Human Rights, insofar as there is a detailed explanation of the concept of flagrant denial of justice or flagrant violation of the right to a fair trial or due process of law. So insofar as the right to a fair trial is concerned, states need to determine and assess the likelihood of a violation in the requesting state. How likely is it that once extradited, a person's right to a fair trial would be violated? So there's an element of foresight and foreseeability there, which is so important. Obviously then, nebis in idem is also related to other rules. In the case of the horizontal system of enforcement, it, it is, doesn't act as a jurisdictional pointsman, unlike in the case of the vertical system of enforcement, where it's multifunctional as we know as a result of the statute, particularly sections 17 and 20. So in this context, I also examine certain important judgments, the judgment which had a great effect in the human rights field, particularly Suring versus United Kingdom, insofar as it led to a string of judgments as a result of which persons um, would not be extradited to um, other case, other countries which uh, were, were in the risk of capital punishment, especially in the context of Suring versus UK, with the various characteristics of death row in the particular state, uh, could be obviously uh, um, actually delivered as a result of, should guilt be found, obviously. So Suring versus UK was also important in this context. And then I analyze what I call comorbidity which is a situation of the likelihood of an unfair trial when the death penalty is the outcome of a, the declaration of guilt. And there obviously you have multiple, possible multiple violations, what I call comorbidity, and I gave an example of the Abdullah Ocalan um, requests by Turkey and the trial obviously in this context for the, pay, former, for the PKK founder. In this process, I find, therefore, that human rights act like a double-edged sword. On the one hand, human rights are crucially important to ensure access to justice, first layer of obligations, duty to investigate by the territorial states, positive obligations of the states, and all the ramifications, including here an important judgment is definitely, besides the Barrios Altos case, which prompt, and other other cases, three children case, etc., Almonacid Arellano, but most importantly, probably Velasquez Rodriguez versus Honduras. And uh, on the one hand, therefore, it, human rights leads to situations whereby there's an obligation to investigate and prosecute. On the other hand, and here we have two prongs acting against each other, unfortunately, hence the need to strike a balance. On the other hand, human rights grounds are the most resilient in terms of grounds for refusal of extradition, as I said. So here we have conflicting situations whereby a balance needs to be struck for the purposes of, and essentially this balance needs to be struck by courts. And probably here I also urge some courts with superior jurisdiction even human rights courts, to exercise certain inherent powers, as the Inter-American Inter Court of Human Rights did in Ifcher Bronstein versus Peru, for example, amongst other cases. In all this, I conclude by assessing the prospect of trials, given the, what I call the judicial, um, 
the proliferation of judicial partnerships and judicial panels, leading to an interactive community of courts, an integrated system, which we need to manage. I think the international community needs to manage somehow this system. And in this context, although I advocate the exercise of universal jurisdiction, not in absentia, uh, I feel that universal jurisdiction is an entitlement. However, it could slowly, gradually become more of an obligation only if it is uh, conditional and subsidiary. Subsidiary in terms of no investigation and no prosecution by the territorial state or the state best suited to prosecute, best placed to prosecute, and conditional, hence relying on custodial jurisdiction. Because, obviously, I am not a supporter of universal jurisdiction in absentia, and I explain why. So in this context, universal jurisdiction could be exercised more, and uh, I hence distinguish a bit between duty to submit to prosecution and duty to prosecute. The duty to prosecute is the duty of the territorial state, the state best place to prosecute. The duty to submit to prosecution is a duty of the custodial state, which really and truly has a triple option. Prosecute, surrender, or extradite. Triple option. And in this context, I also recommend that an international convention for the prevention, prosecution, and punishment, the three Ps of international criminal law, for the prevention, prosecution, and punishment of core crimes could essentially um, contribute by ensuring that the duty to submit to prosecution and the duty to prosecute are crystallized in convention and international law in a clear manner. And besides considering, obviously, the extraordinary dynamics of system criminality, this could um, actually form within the convention a sort of liaison body which would manage this ongoing constructive judicial dialogue. And hence this would be important because we're also seeing that certain states, in my opinion, should, we should also advocate a, um, a development which would facilitate that states, one, states w which have custodial jurisdiction of a person who is suspected of, of committing war crimes, should notify the international community to the effect that obviously they have custody of the person in question. But most of all, I also speak of auxiliary or accessory obligations, one of which is the duty to ensure the collection, the identification, collection, and preservation of evidence, possibly in liaison with other states. And we're seeing this, let's call it quasi-quasi-prosecutorial role rapidly developing. This is an area which is rapidly developing. It's an important area. We've seen the triple IM, the mechanism, the Syria mechanism, UNITAD in so far as accountability for crimes committed by Daesh, etc. So although we don't have fully fleshed prosecutions as a result of these mechanisms, at least we have a preservation of evidence which can be collected. And I note uh, with satisfaction that certain states have already embarked on to, for example, forming specialized prosecution units within their criminal justice systems. And this is probably a best practice which should be followed as well. So whilst looking forward to the comments by our panelists, and I'd like to thank Dr. Nagvi and Josh Prost particularly uh, for uh, their contribution to this event, I finalize by simply citing the words of George Fletcher, which are quite striking in the context of the title to my book. The prosecution, the, the failure, sorry, the failure to prosecute serious crimes is bad, if not worse, than the crime itself. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here tonight. I appreciate very much the invitation to participate in this uh, panel and in the, um, in the launch of this book, and I uh, join in, in commending you, um, Christopher, for what is an impressive work uh, that deals with a complex mixture of issues and includes, from my personal perspective, two of my very 
favorite subjects, which is obviously the prosecution and adjudication of international crime, but also uh, international cooperation. I am a self-confessed international cooperation geek. And so I am uh, delighted to see a work uh, of this depth on that topic and in the context of the prosecution of uh, core crimes. Uh, looking at the complexity of the book, and you've just heard an amazing presentation of, that gives you a sense of the depth of uh, the publication, I was very much spoiled for choice as to the topics I would address in my 10 minutes. Uh, but I'm going to focus basically on two major points uh, which arise uh, from the text itself. The first is discussing the enforcement uh, of the cooperation regime of the International Criminal Court, uh, which was aptly described as perhaps the Achilles heel of the International Criminal Court. And secondly, I'm going to, talk to uh, speak to one of the topics I often address, which is complementarity, the uh, creation of the complementarity regime under the Rome Statute, and the in integral nature of uh, international cooperation to the effectiveness of that regime. So very briefly, I will just give you some thoughts on those two points. Uh, the enforcement regime, and it's been very well highlighted, uh, um, the cooperation regime under the Rome Statute, the great struggle at Rome was to try and get as far a vertical a system as possible against strong forces that were pushing it towards a horizontal place. And I say that from my perspective, coming from Canada, who was one of the states that pushed as hard as we could to try and turn the, uh, the line upward. But you have to appreciate uh, that certainly those of us working at the court now and those even at the time wanted to have an international police force. We wanted enforcement powers. We wanted to uh, be able to issue an international witness subpoena. All of those wonderful things that would make life so much easier as a judge of the ICC. Uh, but you have to recall that every inch of vertical um, extension required the willingness to give up sovereignty. And even though we were in a time, a much better time, it was a wonderful time, it was the best of times, in terms of the idea of giving up some sovereignty for the greater good of multilateralism, it was a window of opportunity to create this court that is closed, shut, and sealed at the moment. Uh, it was still not an opportunity for the, the nature of so for sovereignty to be abandoned in any way. And so I am convinced that given all the conditions, we got probably the best we could get in terms of the text of the Rome Statute, in terms of the mix and balance of those two, uh, two sides. Uh, but however, the problem with its, its enforcement at the end of the day doesn't really rest with what we were able to achieve on paper or not, with what the legal provisions are or not, because fundamentally, all of this operates at the vortex of law and politics. And at the end of the day, even if we'd have gotten stronger provisions, when it comes to actually getting the cooperation, the problems we are running into is the enforcement through which requires political will in so many contexts. And it's also the reality, this is, I think, something that was not taken sufficient account of uh, when we were negotiating, was the reality that the ICC operates consistently in war zones, in places where conflicts are still ongoing or have just finished. And therefore, the idea of how you gather evidence didn't take into account, to the extent perhaps it should have, of how those kinds of contexts would affect our ability to gain cooperation, would affect the ability even to go into the areas where it is needed to in order to gather the, the information needed for the cases. Uh, but as I say, I do remain of the view that, that there were important um, steps taken in the document which make it uh, powerful, at least on paper. And one of the most important was we can say that in terms of pure extradition grounds of refusal, our goal, I, I always refer, I think of uh, Klaus Kress, Professor Kress and myself, because we were a duo, Germany and Canada. We were arguing all these points all the time. And from our perspective, the, the key was to be able to say that there were no grounds of refusal for surrender to the International Criminal Court. And when you speak of pure extradition grounds of refusal, that was accomplished. 
And you may think, in retrospect, it seems like a small matter, but I can tell you that that question was one of the last questions to be resolved at Rome, along with the big package on how complementarity and challenges were going to work. Because there were ingrained grounds of refusal that were constitutional for many countries, including many European countries, such as non-extradition of nationals. And the fact that the Rome Statute, right up into the last days, we were still having to argue why you can't have an effective court if you're able to refuse the extradition of your nationals. And we were able ultimately to come up with a solution, which is why there's actually a definition of surrender and extradition in the Rome Statute, because it was there to distinguish and allow for the constitutional exemptions that were needed in many states. But the accomplishment of one by one striking out military offense exception, political offense exception, uh, dual criminality, that was a major accomplishment in the surrender regime. And as you've rightly highlighted, what remains in terms of surrender are really things that are tied to the nature of the Rome Statute. Obviously, admissibility challenges are necessary that to prevent uh, surrender because that's the complementarity uh, system that was ultimately uh, agreed upon. In essence, on the surrender side, I think that the, the real um, restrictions that came from extradition that did remain, and they weren't grounds of refusal, so they were uh, the requirements for documents, the evidence that has to be produced, which many states were hoping would not be included, but we were ultimately able only to compromise to a certain extent, as well as the very complicated section on competing requests. If you've ever read it, it's like a, it's like a puzzle going through it all, designed by a very brilliant Singaporean. None of the rest of us understood it, but we accept that it, it accomplishes what is necessary. So a pretty strong regime in that respect, and similarly, Equally important on evidence gathering, we got the grounds of refusal, if you will, down to a bare minimum, which is you can only refuse to help in evidence gathering if what's being requested is contrary to something fundamental in your system, and you have an obligation to be able to provide all the types of assistance. But as I say, um, the problems that I think have arisen are in terms of the actual enforcement of that um, of that regime. And here, uh, in terms of some of the solutions that you um, provide in, in, your, um, in your book and you've mentioned tonight, I get nervous with the International Criminal Court when they talk about judicial activism. I think perhaps we should be perhaps a little less judicially active in some contexts. Um, but I do agree with uh, the, the idea of particularly of a uh, stronger use of uh, 612, which I think makes a lot of sense. Bring the cases as far as you can without the presence of the accused, confirm the decisions, confirm the charges, and then the work continues on trying to get the individuals brought before the court. But the fact remains that everyone points to the lack of action and activity at the ICC, and we at the same time have 14 outstanding, uh, 14, 15 numbers fluctuate, outstanding arrest warrants. And that comes down to one thing. States are not fulfilling their obligation to surrender to the International Criminal Court. And the problem with that is a political one. And that is the problem which, in my view, has to be addressed head on. You are absolutely right. There should be a compliance committee. It drives me mad. There is, amongst the states' parties in The Hague, there is a committee on non-cooperation. And in New York, there's a committee on cooperation. Neither one of them ever talk about the actual cases where the, that have been referred to them on the basis of non-cooperation. So to me, that is a problem that has to be addressed square on and should be part of uh, the considerations at the review uh, process. And yes, indeed, uh, we perhaps could, could use stronger language in the cooperation decisions, but at the end of the day, again, what you're always going to run into is the problem of enforcement and the political aspects. It's exactly the same point uh, in terms of the immunities question and Article 98. We, at least the appeals chamber, has resolved the question in terms of the legalities, but the question will be what will happen in the next case that we get and how will that uh, play out. Let me leave that there. I have a lot more I could say on that, but I'll jump quickly just for a few words on, um, on the issue of complementarity. This is something that makes me very 
aggravated. So what was created in Rome, as we all know, we hear this all the time, was not a standalone court. What was created was a system. And the whole point of the system was not to create a super court. It was to motivate states to take up their responsibility to investigate and prosecute these crimes. The ICC itself was to be a court of last resort. The first prosecutor was absolutely correct when he said the court would have been a great success if it never had any cases. So there's the idea. But have you ever noticed whenever anything happens in the world, and sadly it's too often an atrocity, an attack, the first question that everybody asks is, what is the International Criminal Court doing about this? That should be the last question. It should be about what are states doing, what are regions doing, what's the UN doing, and then the court. And part of the problem is that in, in the Rome Statute, we contemplated not just the territorial states, would take responsibility because in most circumstances they're not in a position to do so. We contemplated what was going on at the time, which was a lot of extraterritorial prosecutions. We contemplated those continuing. We contemplated building up national capacity in terms of law and ability so that there would be this web of prosecutions, and that has never happened. And that's where our focus must turn in terms of implementing this whole Rome statute system. Yes, the court has problems. Yes, we have to work on those. But we also have to work on the whole system as a whole. And central to extraterritorial in particular, to encouraging those, is building up ability and capacity in international cooperation. And unfortunately, international cooperation practice is, I did it for eight, nine years, day in, day out. I, I feel the frustration to this day. And it's not only hard. I worked for Canada where we had a pretty strong system. But the frustrations in terms of the ability of states to do this is, is enormous. And in this area, it is particularly complicated and difficult to deal with these crimes in terms of cooperation, in particular surrender, not so much evidence. And you've referred to some of the, the problems. The very protections that are built into extradition to protect rights are the ones which make it so difficult in the context of the worst crime known to mankind. Just a few examples. There are, I think still to this day, individuals from Rwanda uh, accused of genocide in the United Kingdom whose extradition has repeatedly been refused on fair trial issues uh, in terms of returning them to Rwanda. Um, you have situations where nationals, their extradition will be refused, but there is no prospect that there's going to be prosecution in the, nas in the national state for that. Uh, no, no potential whatsoever. You have the, the, the cloud of political offense, which has been worn down, thankfully, by terrorism, but which can still be used in some circumstances and can be used particularly in these, with these types of crimes. Uh, you also have dual criminality. You struggle. Is it sufficient if someone's going to prosecute for murder and not give the charge the aura, if you will, of a crime against humanity, war crime, or genocide? And finally, you have the ever-present, as long as it remains not prohibited at international law, death penalty. Countries seeking extradition will often have the death penalty, and especially for these crimes. So um, the challenges are enormous in cooperation. Uh, I, too, would join you in saying that one of the things we need to improve, uh, states cannot negotiate, small states, states in, uh, in transition cannot negotiate 120-some or 200 or 190 bilateral extradition treaties or cooperation treaties. We are in need of a multilateral instrument. My personal favorite, there's an important initiative uh, of uh, a group of states, uh, including the Netherlands, uh, which is uh, pushing for a convention on mutual legal assistance, which includes both evidence gathering and extradition for these core crimes. They're going to negotiation in June, and I, any state representatives here, I urge you to look at that initiative. It's very important for improving cooperation in this area. And I also, there is also the International Law Commission's draft uh, for a convention against crimes against humanity, which takes a bit of a different twist, but should not be seen as counter to the MLA initiative. They can both 
be, play an important role in this field in encouraging the prosecution, the investigation and prosecution of these crimes. Uh, as I said, many more things, uh, but I prefer to hear the discussion here, so I'm going to stop there. But again, um, congratulations on a tremendous book that raises so many issues that brings us all here tonight. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, to Christopher for this uh, writing this uh, really interesting book and to the Asser Institute for inviting me here tonight to speak to you about it. Um, I must admit when I published a book in 2010 on impediments to prosecuting international crimes, I thought I did a, an okay job of kind of identifying a few problems there were, obstacles to prosecuting international crimes, but uh, I must admit after reading this uh, tome on the, the global prosecution of core crimes in international law. I realise that my limiting myself to six major impediments seems a little bit cursory now. <laughs> uh, Dr Soler has written a really thought-provoking book uh, that examines the main juridical obstacles to surrender and extradition of individuals accused of these core crimes. But that seemingly uh, straightforward premise of this book belies the complexity of the international legal architecture that needs to be navigated to determine if such obstacles can be effectively hurdled or not. So while this book's purpose is to examine these juridical obstacles to extradition and surrender, it ends up doing a lot more than that. Uh, it offers a real deconstruction of international criminal law and the systems of enforcement, both the vertical and the horizontal ones that emanate from that system. And by doing that deconstruction, the book offers a perspective on the legal philosophical basis of international criminal law. And this basis, this perspective, of course, informs the way that uh, the obstacles to extradition and surrender are looked at and ultimately how the whole project of international criminal law is looked at. So I'd like to offer a few comments on these types of uh, perspectives which are put forward uh, in this book. And perhaps to ask uh, Dr Solera to, to expand upon some of them. So the first is the perspective that core crimes always involve the responsibility of the state in some level. So in putting forward this workable definition of core crimes, the book argues that a core crime would be an act or omission of an individual which is prohibited under customary international law, which is also accompanied by some contextual elements, one of which would be premeditation, usually involving groups. Another would be attacking and harming universal values by breaching human security. And the third is this engendering of both individual criminal responsibility and state aggravated responsibility. And it's that last aspect that I wanted to comment on. So the book notes that non-state actors can also commit uh, international crimes. However, in this respect, it's argued that the state has been unable to counter that threat or those crimes perpetrated by the non-state group. So in that way, the state is involved. And secondly, the book posits that another characteristic of core crimes is the failure of the state to investigate and prosecute such crimes. Now, while this can no doubt commonly be the case, I'd like to know a bit more from Dr. Seller why, in his view, this has to be part of the notion of core crime. So there are many crimes, obviously, that are not investigated or prosecuted, but does that actually change the fact that such behaviour itself is outlawed? It's argued that crimes become particularly serious when the state where they are committed does not fulfil its obligation to prosecute. As put in this book, seriousness resides in the fact that the crimes are not investigated and prosecuted, not that they are universally condemned or universally abhorred. So in this sense, I wonder whether that idea conflates the crime itself 
with the duty to prosecute or the additional problem of impunity. So if a core crime is one that always involves a failure by the territorial state to prosecute, where does that leave complementarity? So it's argued in the book that the litmus test of unwillingness and or inability ultimately justifies the entire edifice upon which contemporary international criminal justice is grounded. I find that a little difficult to reconcile with the fact that complementarity begins at home, that is, on the national level. Or to put it a different way, if the territorial state does prosecute a crime, let's say a genocidal act, does this mean that the crime is any less of an international crime? If the international criminal project works like it should, as Judge Prost was describing, the ICC should be a court of last resort. The domestic courts uh, should be prosecuting any crimes over which they have jurisdiction. So if this really happens, then this doesn't take away from the gravity of those crimes. It doesn't render them anything less of international concern. But this idea is an important tenet of this book because it explains why Dr. Soler takes a restrictive interpretation uh, for grounds for refusal um, of surrender and extradition. Further, the book asks, who would expect a state to prosecute its own leaders and high public officials when those same leaders appointed and nominated the public prosecutors and judges who are expected to uphold the law? But this seems to assume that such decisions would be a valid one. Yet international law, such as the Geneva Conventions or the Torture Convention, would expect prosecutors to do exactly that. So in other words, I would answer, international law does expect that. And with regard to the inability limb, the book notes that when a state loses control over its territory, it can be categorised as a failed state and becomes unable to prosecute. So the argument is that in order to protect its citizens, the state has to have a monopoly over the use of force in that territory. But if the state defaults in that task, it will forfeit its privileges as a sovereign entity and the international community would become authorised or even obliged to intervene. And that default can happen where the state is too strong, that is when it's repressing its citizens, or if the state is too weak and it cannot protect its citizens. So Dr. Soler noted, uh, notes that Syria, where chemical weapons have been re become regular attacks, uh, is an example where both of these predicaments seem to be fused. Uh, and the book argues that Syria, having allegedly used chemical weapons on its citizens, has a rogue state dimension and is emblematic of a structural inability to act, as opposed to an incidental failure to act. So this, in this theory, would trigger the right or obligation of other states or the international community to intervene. So I wonder whether this structural inability really just means unwillingness. Further, considering that Syria did accede to the Chemical Weapons Convention in 2013, and therefore has an obligation to enact domestic uh, legislation, criminalising the use of chemical weapons on its territory, can you really still find that Syria is a failed state if it decides not to do that? Or should the international community be intervening at this point? In this book, it's argued that the involvement of the state is also paramount in crimes against humanity. So while it's recognised that non-state groups may have the necessary structure, uh, some non-state groups may have the necessary structure to actually prepare and plan such a crime, it's still contended that the widespread and systematic requirement means that the official state authorities don't have the power to counter uh, such a crime. Um, so this unable and unwilling uh, test is used as part of the notion of the crime itself, with the argument that owing to the unable and unwilling criteria, one may reasonably conclude that the policy must be furthered by an organisation 
with some metal, not merely a private entity pursuing the objective of attacking a civilian population. Moreover, it's argued that a private entity is most unlikely to undertake a widespread or systematic attack against a civilian population. So here I'd like to pose the question, well, what about, for example, the attacks of 9-11? Wouldn't these qualify as crimes against humanity? And weren't these perpetrated against a country that remained quite able and willing to prosecute and which had a monopoly over force? And while it's no doubt true that states are more easily able to marshal the resources to launch an attack against a civilian population, this doesn't rule out uh, that some non-state groups might also have that ability. Another interesting idea uh, put forward in this book is the argument that the responsibility to protect notion is also part of the notion of a core crime. So the idea is that the presence of an individual who's accused of having perpetrated a core crime in another state can trigger the responsibility to protect of the state in which he is present, especially if the international community has failed to protect the victim group. So the state must either prosecute the person or extradite them uh, to the ICC, for example. So in this way, it's argued that the responsibility to protect principle can assume the shape and form of out de dare, out judicare. So this is argued to mean that an entitlement to prosecute might be transformed into a duty uh, when the third state has custodial jurisdiction over an individual. And these concepts and the link to the state form the basis to much of the philosophical underpinnings uh, of the book, which hew to this idea that since core crimes entail both individual and state aggravated responsibility, the state is failing to live up to its duties in not prosecu prosecuting and justifies the external intervention uh, of the international community. And finally, um, one comment on the use of the word uh, pitfall, which Dr. Seller uses to describe various juridical rules uh, that may end up blocking enforcement, specifically extradition at the horizontal level. So he argues in his book that uh, this word is more appropriate uh, than the word impediment, uh, which is the word I used in my book to describe obstacles to prosecuting international crimes. So in his view, impediment is more appropriate to the harmonised vertical system uh, of enforcement um, and is more fixed or definite and can actually block extradition, can be mandatory and precedes the contentious fact. Now, I don't want to get caught up into a semantics uh, here, but since the book specifically takes issue uh, with my use of that word, uh, I would posit to Dr. Soler that these aspects of the word impediment are precisely the point. Um, an impediment is, in fact, a conflicting legal rule that itself has its own legitimate uh, policy reasons and needs to be reconciled in one way or another with the imperative to prosecute an international crime. The word pitfall, uh, meaning an unsuspected danger or difficulty, um, might have trouble really fully capturing that legal quandary uh, that a court might need to, to deal with, and really the need to have this carefully balanced, uh, reasoned balancing of interests, which you described in your opening remarks, um, in order to come to some kind of adequate uh, solution. So the word impediment, in my mind, shouldn't be necessarily read as, as meaning something necessarily being a problem um, to the functioning of international criminal law, but really something that, an obstacle which needs to be properly considered by a court when deciding whether or not to exercise jurisdiction. And the matter of amnesties is actually a good example of that. While the book provides an overview of judicial practice attesting to the incompatibility of amnesties with the duty to prosecute, uh, 
heinous crimes or the right to the truth, effective remedy, reparations, it also stops short of identifying a bright line rule to that effect. Instead, it concludes that amnesties are increasingly skating on thin ice and more carefully posits a rebuttable presumption that amnesties that are detrimental to the protection of human rights should subsist. So in conclusion, this book is an extremely rich and thoughtful consideration of a system of enforcement of international criminal law. It focuses perhaps on the weakest points of that system and comes up with innovative and fresh approaches for overcoming them. It covers a huge amount of territory in so doing and I've only been able to speak about a few small points within a huge work. So it will no doubt be a useful tool for practitioners and scholars alike working at the international and national levels and in between those levels to further strengthen the system against impunity. Thank you very much for this very well, comprehensive presentation to start with and then the very interesting responses as well. Maybe you'd like to briefly respond to the Thank you very uh, much for members these, of the panel. Yeah. For these very fruitful comments, very thought-provoking. In so far as the feedback by Judge Prost, I think we're lucky enough to be able to have such a wealth of information as a result of the wealth of experience of Judge Prost, even in the negotiations within those very busy weeks in Rome. And probably, um, when I consider what Dr. Nagvi just said, I, I might adopt maybe a more philosophical um, uh, view of the pretext as a result of which international criminal law exists and subsists in the first place. And maybe I depoliticize it a bit, not like Christine van den Winkart's depoliticizing formula, but I remove or else underestimate the uh, realpolitik, the uh, underlying political reality, uh, as a result of which one needs to consider each and every ground for refusal of surrender, even possibly within this uh, context. Obviously, I wanted my work to be very juridical, very legal. In fact, part two is where I indulge into an explanation of core crimes. It is the least legal from a purely juridical point of view. It is the least technical part of my work. However, this, this, uh, this dimension, the political dimension in each and every consideration and each and every recommendation, suggestion, proposal, not to mention the judgments which I cite, the, the, the political spectrum and dimension is crucial. In relation to what you said as well, Judge Prost, I wanted to ask whether you are concerned, I mean, I, I, I'm, very much, I'm very much aware with the importance of the MLA initiative, but I, and I know they're meeting in Ljubljana in June, um, I'm, con I'm a bit concerned with an article, I think it's 52, which deals with amnesties and pardons and uh, the extent to which this, um, including the grounds for refusal of extradition, which are also modeled in a rather general way. If I recall, there is a section, a proposed draft section, which states that uh, a ground for refusal could also actually relate to the security and safety. This is very generally worded, in my opinion. Um, whether you're concerned with any legal ramifications which might, which may, in the near future, ensue therefrom, and I'm glad to note that you, you um, also embraced uh, certain ideas, including a stronger use of 61 sub Article 2, the Compliance Committee as a subsidiary organ of the ASP, and the need for a multilateral treaty. And in this context as well, one would need to see whether the draft articles on the Convention Against Crimes Against Humanity would cater for all the needs and exigencies which we currently, uh, which the international community is currently facing in this context. I thank also her, Dr. Nagvi for her critique, uh, if I may address a few points. Um, in so far as the very valid point she raised in the beginning, the philosophical underpinning, I 
might not have explained this so thoroughly, but I thought I did. Maybe uh, it's the phenomenal. It, the, 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 the link up with the state is a phenomenological aspect and feature of core crimes, but it's not a constitutive element thereof. So I argue that the failure to prosecute does not mean that a core crime has been committed. And likewise, if a state prosecutes, it does not mean that the core crime has not been committed. So really and truly, it's a consequential characteristic, a feature, and here again I distinguish between uh, a situation which is non-legal and very juridical, whereas an element of the crime would be the contextual element itself, hence the link with the state, for example, widespread systematic attack against the civilian population, as a, uh, just as an example in so far as crimes against humanity are concerned. So I uh, did refer to some philosophical underpinnings the principle of international harm and human security and also uh, certain works by some uh, professors such as uh, David Luban amongst others um, in this context however the uh, characteristics and I distinguished between the characteristics and features on one hand characteristics and features being pretty much the same thing as opposed to elements of crimes on the other hand and in this context also sometimes citing some case law even in connection with the ability of the state uh, I think it was Lima and uh, the Lima case before the Yugoslavia tribunal um, uh, the concept of equality of arms for example uh, in so far as uh, there has to be uh, a fighting chance for the non-state actor to actually imperil uh, stability within the state itself. This is, this is what I recall particularly, hence it's more indicative. I would say it's, uh, um, uh, the, the structure in impunity is also an indicia of either unwillingness or inability. In relation to the 9-11 attacks, predominantly and I appreciate that this is a very important point. In fact, in part two, I deal with terrorism and trafficking in human beings, which uh, very much are, are in between, probably, as, and I pick on these two crimes specifically, in between and very close to becoming core crimes or being categorized as core crimes. So I appreciate the link, and 9-11 is obviously... Um, uh, I also refer to nine, the 9-11 attacks. My opinion, the contextual element would be missing, and hence I don't think we can consider the 9-11 attacks as crimes against humanity per se. The R2P, I feel and I acknowledge that it's not hard law, but it might be a developing rule and a developing responsibility. I appreciate very much your point on pitfalls and impediments, um, and it's true I did criticize the word impediments, but in the footnote, I refer to your impressive work. <laughs> and in fact, I did make it a point to write that because I felt that your work was a guiding source of knowledge for myself, um, and it did really inspire me, especially in the context of the way you uh, considered the grounds for refusal and uh, in fact, I made ample reference to your works and to various ideas and suggestions which emanate from your work, such as, amongst others, if I recall, the reasons, and I agreed fully with you there, the reasons uh, which, as a result of which functional immunities are displaced um, when uh, persons are brought uh, before international courts to face uh, trial. And hence, and even you, 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 you refer very much to uh, um, the hierarchy of norms, concept of use cogens norms as basically displacing rules regulating immunities, if I recall. So, and there I very, I very much shared your ideas in that regard too. I don't know if I addressed, I addressed all the points. And I don't know, Midran. <laughs> yes, I think um, it's now time for the, uh, for the general audience to also engage in the discussion that has already started.